Good morning and welcome to our worship service on this 15th Sunday after Pentecost, uh, the first weekend in September. Let us begin our worship this morning with the singing of the first hymn, number 537, Onward Christian Soldiers Marching As to War.
If you would take your service folder and please arise. We worship today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless, worrying, and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do. You should cast me away from your presence forever. O Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Our Old Testament lesson on this 15th Sunday after Pentecost is in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4, verses 1 to 2 and 6 to 8. Deuteronomy is sort of Moses' farewell speech. He's now 120 years old. It was, he was 80 when he got asked by God to do the job of going back to Egypt and taking on Pharaoh and getting the children of Israel out of the Egypt and slavery and get them to the promised land. And I have no trouble understanding Moses at this age when he was 80 years old saying, I don't want to do that. I'm happy with my life. I'm good here. <laughs> I got my sheep, I got my wife, I got my kids, and now you want me to do what? Go back there, take on the king, the king of Egypt. Uh, who knows who remembers what uh, I might have done to a few people while I was back there. And who's going to believe me? When I thought of that, you know, as you think about that, go back to, go back even to the Israelites. Find maybe the leaders of some of the Israelites and say, you know, I was out in the desert. You might not remember me. It's been 40 years since, since I fled Egypt. But I was out there in the desert and there was this bush burning, but it really wasn't burning. And God talked to me. So Moses, why should they believe me? Why should they believe what I'm going to tell them and that, God, you talked to me, and this is what I came to do. And he had other excuses, too. You know, I'm not a good speaker. I stutter a little bit. We'll have Aaron help you. And he had a bunch of other excuses and reasons not to do it, and finally got to the point, you're doing it. And Moses is like, okay. And after two years, they made it to the promised land. You think Moses would have had a few more excuses at that burning bush if he knew the job was entail another 40 years of his life to get from Egypt all just to Israel? I think he might have used that as an excuse also. You want me to work how long before I finally get to retire? And now he knew when he retired, he goes straight to heaven. And he's seen the generation that didn't believe God's words as they got to the southern end and said, we, we can't conquer these people, we can't do this job, we're going back to Egypt. And God said, fine, you won't get the promised land, I'll give it to your kids. So there aren't many peers for Moses left anymore. Joshua, Caleb, even his brother and sister are gone by this time. Everybody else is 40 years or more younger than him. And now he's giving them some, I'll say, grandpa advice. He says, you really want to have a good relationship with God? Then listen to him. There's a lot of people that think they're God and tell God what to do, but if you really want a good relationship with him, listen to him. He says, now Israel, hear the decrees and laws I am about to teach you. Follow them so that you may live and may go in and take possession of the land the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. Do not add to what I command you, and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. Observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations, who will hear about all these decrees and say, Surely 
This great nation is a wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I am setting before you today? Here ends the Old Testament lesson. If you would turn to page 111, we'll sing Psalm 119C. Psalm 119C on page 111. The epistle lesson will be the sermon text this morning, so I'll read that at that time from Ephesians chapter 6. So we'll continue with the gospel lesson in Mark chapter 7, starting at verse 1. Moses told the people, don't add to the law, don't take away from the law. Luther had that as one of his major, say, slogans for what he thought was important in a way to follow God. We had the three slogans, sola scriptura, sola gratia, sola fide, which were Latin for scripture alone, grace alone, faith alone. That scripture and scripture alone is where we are told what to do and what not to do and how we're saved, the law and the gospel. And then obviously that gospel, that we're saved by God's grace. God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross. He paid for every one of our sins so we won't have to earn our way to heaven just believe that it's a gift from him. That's where the faith came in. But with the sola scriptura, and, and, and as Moses said, don't add or take away, that we've always had that as Lutherans, that if God says don't do this, then we understand we should not be doing those things. If God says to do these things, these are the things we should do. And if God doesn't speak on an issue, then we have freedom. We have choice. How do you want to do this? We've got leeways. You want to do it this way? I mean, there's nothing that says what color house do you have to have? What color carpet do we have to have in a church? And so many other things that I won't even get close to border ones. But every once in a while, people always want to say, oh, we've got to do this if we really want to be a Christian. And unfortunately, that's what happened at the time of Jesus with the Pharisees. They had good intentions. They had good intentions. The Pharisaic organization that was started about 50, 60 years before Jesus was born Basically, they looked around on themselves. You know, we're not following what Moses told us to do. We're not listening. We should be reading the Bible more. We should be more dedicated to our sacrifices. We should be better husbands. We should be better fathers. What can we do? So they had that sort of club 
to encourage each other to be better followers of God. But once they got done with the basic laws of Moses, which said, don't do this, do do this, it's like, well, what can we do even more? So they started saying, how much of the Bible do you have to read per day? How much do you have to have it memorized? How far on a Sunday can you actually walk before it's work? So they actually measured it out and said, 1,000 steps. If you only do 999 steps on the Sabbath day, you're good. And if you take 1,001, you're a sinner. And they had a whole bunch of other things like how to wash your hands. The proper way to wash your hands. Now I know we've gotten into that a little bit lately because we teach our kids, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, and do that twice, and then that's how long enough to wash your hands. Okay, but we haven't made that a commandment yet. <laughs> or how fast or slow you sing happy birthday to you to get your hands thoroughly washed. We haven't made that a commandment yet. And that's why Jesus was a little concerned that they've been taking their man-made commandments and elevating them to his commandments and then judging other people who don't keep them the same way and trying to get that through to these people to help them understand the law was help you to see that you're a sinner and to control behavior, but you've lost the gospel. You've lost the gospel that God loves you and cares for you. And even the Sabbath day about not doing work, that was to tell people, take a day off. It was a commandment to take a day off. And as Paul said in another place, he didn't even care what day it was. Take a day off. If you're a nurse, you're a policeman, you work weekends, Saturday and Sunday, take some day off. Because you need just don't work every day. God gave his commandments out of love, not to punish us or just to control us. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is unwashed. And the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, hold to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and kettles. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? And Jesus replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside of a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, and arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Here ends the gospel lesson. If you would arise and take the insert from today's service folder, let us join together in professing our Christian faith using today the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose in accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. 
and we'll continue with the singing of our next hymn, number 475, The Man is Ever Blessed Who Shuns the Sinner's Ways. Grace be to you, and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text upon which we base our meditation today is the book of Ephesians, as Paul finishes us this letter to that church, chapter 6, verses 10 to 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord, and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able, will, may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me, that whenever I speak, words may be given so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly, as I should. This is God's word. Dear friends in Christ, the start of this week, six days ago, did not look good. I was watching the news and COVID numbers going up. I knew that from my history of being out at Tillamook and serving a little congregation over out there for about 35 years, one Sunday a month, 
I knew the funeral director out there, and I saw him on TV. And I saw him in regard to the article that in 18 months they had six people die of COVID in the city of Tillamook, and now they had seven die of COVID in seven days. And so he was one of those requesting a refrigerator truck so that he could have enough place to store the bodies until they could have the funeral out there. And then all that Afghanistan stuff, I mean, watching people desperate because they knew their lives were in danger to get out of the country. And even the ones I saw on the regular news, you know, that because they had been translators, they had helped us in other things. I also knew from Christian Radio and others, all these people that had come to become Christians and listening to how people over here were trying to get money to help those people get out of the country too. And then maybe on a lighter note, I knew at the beginning of this week, by the end of the week, I would be turning 66 years old. What a bummer. When I do things, I feel like I'm still in my 40s or 50s. When I look in the mirror, I say, almost 80. (laughs) So what do you do? What did I do? Well, two things made a difference this week. The first one was a simple, earthly, practical answer to get myself away from the news and to get my mind off getting older. Lynn and I and the two grandsons headed to Cannon Beach. They were ready to go. We pulled up in front of their house at 10 o'clock in the morning, and there they were, looking out the picture window, waiting to go. So I was, well, I guess we're not forcing them to come along with us. So we got everything in the car for the day and for the promised sleepover at Grandma's house, and we headed out to the beach. And we headed to Tolavana Park, the wayside there, and we got our gourmet lunch out for lunch. We had this fine spread of PP and J and string cheese and carrots and strawberries and grapes and some kind bars. It was amazing. Everybody had what they wanted. Then we headed to the beach and we did an awesome thing. We dug a hole. Because when you're with a four-year-old and a nine-year-old, that's what you do to enjoy the beach. We dig a hole. And then once you have a hole, you know what you have to do next. You got to go get some ocean water and carry it in little plastic buckets from the ocean to pour it in your hole. Upon their discovery that it doesn't stay there very long. But they still did it and enjoyed it and asked us to help. But after a while, when knowing that the water was never going to stay in that hole, at least the sand got wet. And now you can make castles easier and build at least a fort around your hole. And then we did get the stunt kite out. And the nine-year-old's getting better. He doesn't cross his hands so much, and Grandpa has to say, stop. (laughs) In fact, he got so good by after a while that he said, I'm ready to stop now because his arms, little arms were starting to get tired. Now we didn't put the stunt kite on the four-year-old because we didn't want to see the, cunt, the kite drag him through the sand. So we didn't do that with him. But he was okay because he was still on his hole. The tide went out, got down to the, the area where we could walk around among the rocks and see sea stars and anemones and an urchin. They say they saw an octopus, but I'm not too sure. And then we went and got ice cream. And then we got in the car. And the four-year-old fell asleep for about an hour. And then we went to that gourmet restaurant called Burgerville in Hillsboro and took that from the takeout window over to a park and we sat and ate dinner. Came home, watched a Disney movie on TV, said our prayers and crashed. And Grandpa and Grandpa crashed. And the next day we got up and French toast and bacon with lots of syrup. And played a game of Rummy Royal, teaching the grandkids how to gamble and play with chips. (laughs) 
and then mini golf and drop them off at their house and grandma and grandpa come back again and crash. It was a good aid to my mentality and my attitude to go back and look at simple things. It is why I enjoy some of you who send pictures to Facebook and their pictures of flowers and their pictures of trees and their pictures of your family getting together in small groups or medium-sized groups and in just enjoying your life with one another. To remind me that you and I need to do that, count our simple blessings from time to time, to counteract all the crud that is also out there influencing our mood, our attitude, or even how we feel about our lives. We need to look at simple things. Trees that are starting to maybe turn color. A cool morning, but a warm afternoon. The sun is still out, unless it's behind a little smoke or little clouds once in a while. But we still have many blessings from God that we don't want to wait till Thanksgiving Day to count. But we still do that. But I reminded myself I needed to focus. Because it doesn't automatically happen because the devil gets me very distracted by everything else. And that's why when I read God's Word, I remind myself sometimes it's important what to do in God's Word. Because there's the practical thing to do, but I also know God tells me go back to His Word for comforting passages. But not all the passages in God's Word are comforting. And that's why at the beginning of this week, as I have my other Bible at home, I have an Old Testament bookmark and I have a New Testament bookmark. So a little bit this week, then the next week the other one. A little bit this week... And it just so happened that on Monday I started Jeremiah. That is not a book of the Bible to start your week in. <laughs> it's just not. Everything was going wrong. The people weren't believing, all the other stuff. And it's like, i got to get back to the Gospels. i got to get back to the New Testament this week just because I need something different from God's Word. Not all of God's Word. God's Word will bring you back into a good mood. And this text today helped. It helped. Because first it reminded me against who's behind all this junk. When it tells me to put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, authorities, and powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's not going to be on the news. You're not going to see that on Fox, CNN, ABC, CBS, or NBC. Who's really behind all the crud that's out there in the world and in our lives because of sin that he got into the world in the first place with Adam and Eve. The devil is out there using all these things to get us to ask ourselves a few questions. It's the same temptation question that was asked of Adam and Eve when they were in the Garden of Eden before they sinned. And the devil pointed out that tree that God said, leave this one alone. Leave this one alone. This is the way you can worship me. This is the way you can praise me. This is the way you can thank me for all the other things you have on this earth. Leave this one tree alone. And the devil's temptation was, God is holding out on you. Your life could be better. Your life could be happier. You could be smarter, more intelligent. You could be like God if you ate of that tree. God doesn't really love you as much as you think. Those are the same temptations that the devil uses on you and me today. God does not love us or else you wouldn't have this problem. God doesn't love us or you wouldn't have this issue. God isn't really protecting us. God isn't really caring for us. And he's not as almighty as you claim him to be. Otherwise, your life would be better. He's still using those same temptations. And Paul knew it. He's in jail right now. He was not being figurative when he said, I'm an ambassador in chains. He's in Rome, he's in prison, awaiting that first trial after the shipwreck off the island of Malta, and then the, he gets another ship to finally get him to Rome to plead his case that he's not preaching a heretical type of religion. And the Ephesians were worried about him and also asking those questions. If Paul is a missionary for the one and only God, the almighty, powerful, and loving God, then how come he's languishing in a prison? 
And it's been over three years since he first got arrested in Jerusalem because he was in Caesarea for a couple years. Then you got the Crete, then you got the shipwreck, then you got Malta, and now he's finally in Rome, and now he's awaiting trial. So it wasn't some quick, speedy, you're in one day, out on bail the next. And so the Ephesians are concerned. But when Paul writes this letter, he just gives them more preaching advice as we've been going through over the last few weeks. Husbands and wives, how should you treat each other? All these other advice to kids and all the other things. And, but mostly, again, for those first three chapters, you are loved by God, and remember he loved you so much he had his son die on the cross so you get to go to heaven for free. For saved by faith alone, not by works, was in this book of Ephesians to help them remember to look past some of the obvious earthly things to what God really has done for us. He wanted them to focus on that so that they don't get tricked by the devil with his schemes. So in a way, he uses now a metaphor of a properly dressed soldier. And that's why when we sang that first hymn, Onward Christian Soldiers, it's so weird to have hear some people say in some other Christian denominations, we got to get rid of that song because it's militaristic. <laughs> so, it's like, did you read the song? <laughs> did you catch the words? Onward Christian soldiers is not, let's leave the Lutheran church here and we'll go down and attack the assembly of God. It doesn't say that. Let's go beat up on Catholics. It doesn't say that. Those Methodists will get them Friday. <laughs> That's not what honored Christian soldiers is all about. Now, it is militaristic because it uses those, those words. But it's against the devil and his schemes and, and, and the powers of darkness, not, not some other people that we don't agree with, like go back and get the Pharisees or something like that. It's not what the song is about. It's again getting those bits of advice from God to say, how can we fight the bad attitude? How can we fight the hopelessness? How can we fight the crud that affects our joy and, uh, and attacks our hope and faith? And we start, I'm going to, you know, there's a list here, obviously, of the buckle and the breastplate and the greaves that would go on the feet, and the shield, and the helmet, and other stuff. I can honestly say, I've never put any of that stuff on. And so the metaphor doesn't work for me as well as when you're living in the Roman world, and they know what a Roman soldier looks like all the time. But it's not hard to understand what Paul wants me to get to. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. So if I want to get ready to fight and, uh, and, and fight back the things that are against me, I've got to start with the Word of God. And that's where, as I said, maybe Jeremiah was, wouldn't work well, well for that. But there are ones like, God so loved the world that he gave his one only Son. Saved by grace alone, not by works. The Lord is my shepherd, I'll lack nothing. These are passages that will definitely remind me of who's in charge and how much I'm loved who's got my back and my front and my sides, and who's with me all the time. And to remind myself, the stuff that's in the Bible is true. It's not social media. It's not, well, somebody thought this would be like that. And that's why, again, I, I thank God that Christians have this book as opposed to some of the other religions. Now, again, not to attack those other religions, say, bluntly, but, you know, the Mormons have a book how many writers? One guy. The Muslims have a book. How many writers? One guy. This book that we use, over 60 different people, over 1,500 years of time, from Moses to John, that all agreed with the plan of salvation. God will take care of us by in the Old Testament, sending somebody in the future to take care of our biggest problem, the sins that keep us having a relationship with a holy God, and the New Testament, which shows us going backwards, we know who it is. It's like the symbolism we have on the altar. Instead of like the Old Testament, where they had one seven set of candles, the menorah, to light their temple, 
we use two. Because the one on the left reminds us of the Old Testament, pointing ahead to Christ. And the one on the right reminds us our New Testament teachings, which point back to Christ. It's not just a feng shui we're working at up here. <laughs> it has a purpose. It has a purpose, that symbolism. That the center of our faith is that cross, but not the cross, really. It's who was on the cross. And I say was on the cross because that's also important. Jesus did die on that cross, but he's not there. He rose again three days later from the dead, showed himself to the disciples for 40 days to help them, again, get out of their funk and their sadness and their what's going to happen to us next fears and then left them with that courage and gave them that gift of the Holy Spirit to speak the different languages and to get out there and share what they had learned from him that you can be saved too. This guy by the name of Jesus who was born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, came out of Egypt so he fulfills all three prophecies of the Old Testament that the Savior would come out of Egypt, be a Nazarene, and born in Bethlehem, which confused the people in the Old Testament. Where is he really coming from? Jesus came from all three. That's what Luke and Matthew tried to put together to help people understand in their good news. God keeps all of those predictions, and they get fulfilled in Jesus. And that's the truth. And we start with that truth, because we can, and, and remind ourselves it is true. It's not iffy, it's not maybe, or that's your opinion. Jesus wants to know, I'm giving you facts through my apostles. I'm giving you a facts through my prophets. So then you can have the breastplate of righteousness. Uh, what's the banner? What's the thing we stand for? What's our coat of arms? Jesus simplified the commandments down to two, didn't he? Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. In case anybody says, oh, there's too many commandments to memorize. I can't do that. Oh. Love God, love your neighbor as ourself. That's our code. And then thinking of the next things he wants us to think of, the gospel of peace. That's really the big, important thing that makes us ready. I know where I'm going for eternity. Not based on who I am or what I've accomplished in this life. I'm going, I know where I'm going for eternity because Jesus said so. Jesus told me he got it all done. He yelled from that cross, it is finished. The work of saving me, the work of saving you was finished. The work was accomplished. It was done. Even when he went to visit his friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and Bethany, and both the women said, if you had been here, he would not have died. And Jesus knew that, which is why he had actually delayed coming to Bethany. He waited till his friend Lazarus died because he wanted them to have another gift the gift of seeing how powerful he was, in including love. That he could raise their brother after he'd already been in the grave for a few days, which is why they said, you don't want to roll that stone back because he already smells. Do you believe in the resurrection of the dead? Martha was asked, yes, Lord, I believe that. She believed the truth. She was ready. She had the gospel of peace. She knew about her returning to Lazarus, and in a way, she wasn't worried about where Lazarus had gone, but she at that time was wondering if we should have Lazarus with her a little bit longer before they all got older and died, because Lazarus is not with us today. He's still not walking around out there. Uh, he, he did die again, and uh, at what Jesus thought was a more proper time, and ended up in heaven. And that's the faith we have, the confidence that we do have a God who loves us and cares for us and we can trust. But the devil's still going to get me to doubt. The devil's still going to get me to ask questions. The devil's going to still tempt me from time to time. Is it really true? And that's why Paul says we've got to remember to pray. We've got to ask God for help with our faith and our breastplate of righteousness and to have confidence in the truth and enjoy the gospel of peace. He will answer that prayer. And then pray for others. 
So as I said, love God and love others as yourself. Pray for others to have those same blessings from God and enjoy those blessings. And, and as we talk to each other and, and we confess sometimes our, our, our weaknesses and our, and our doubts, that we don't just say to the other person, well, stop that. <laughs> we say, I have some too. What does God tell us to do? Get back into his word, encourage one another, and pray that he will help us through those things. Do we have any doubt that God will answer a prayer that way, the correct way? I mean, if I ask for a yacht for my next birthday, should I expect that? I don't think so. Now, some of you, because some of you have done this before, I said once, should I pray for a big house in my retirement? And somebody gave you a model house for my train set. That, and I know I did the same thing. I gave my 16-year-old firstborn a car for her 16th birthday. It was in a box about this big, a nice Mustang, blue, the color she wanted. So that's not what I mean when I say next year you can get me a yacht. It, but you can do it as a joke if you remember. You can get me a little boat, maybe at least with a battery in it. so. Because <laughs> that's the fun thing about being Christians with each other. We can have some of these joys because when that happened, when somebody bought me a house like that, I said, at least I know they were listening, Lord. <laughs> I wasn't just talking to a bunch of people who stare at me. But when we ask for those things he knows we should have, he's certainly going to give them to us and help us with them. Even if he uses two little kids to remind me of the simple blessings I have, and then go back to his word and say, you're going to heaven. I've already got that taken care of. Enjoy, enjoy the peace of God. Amen. May the love of God, which he does have for you and for me, and which goes beyond our understanding, keep your hearts and your minds focused on Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Included in our prayers today is Joanne Groth, who's on our organ bench uh, today, helping us with our worship service, her cousin Tom. Uh, Tom and his wife all have a regular problem throughout their life. They're both blind, and, uh, but deaf. deaf. And, uh, but they get through life with each other and support each other. Uh, but Tom this week was found unresponsive, and medics were called to the house. Um, you helped him regain consciousness, got him to the hospital, but they're still running tests for heart things, stroke things, and other things. We include him in our prayers. Dear Heavenly Father, I am reminded again that though on the news there is sort of one disease being talked about on a regular daily basis, as it should be, because it is a big issue. Help me to remember that also many other people are dealing with what we call the regular things and the regular problems, both small and big and bring them to you in prayer, as you tell me to bring just other things to you in prayer. Help the doctors find whatever the problem is. And then help the doctors even come up with not just a prognosis and a diagnosis, but also a remedy, so that he can be at home again with his wife and enjoy the life that you have blessed them with. I've only met them a couple of times at various family gatherings at the Gross, but uh, even with their handicap, the joy that they have in, in, in life and each other is something not to take for granted either. Help me to see these things in life and put always the best spin and construction on simple things, just like you blessed me this week with peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and string cheese and strawberries sitting out by your wonderful, glorious beaches. Thank you for family, thank you for friends, but most of all, thank you again for sending Jesus to die on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for going and doing that, getting, you got punished for my sins. The things I deserve to be punished for, you got punished for in my place. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for helping me believe the truth so I can enjoy the gospel of peace. 
Amen. Let us join also together in the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. We'll continue with the singing of the next hymn, number 474. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. And let's do that literally this morning. So if you would please arise. Please be seated. This draws our regular service to a close. Uh, just some announcements before we uh, stop the YouTube feed. Uh, the Bethany Bible class uh, finished up the, gospel, the epistles of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John during the summer, so we're going to start a new book uh, study uh, through women's uh, ministry. 
in God's garden. There's some books on the table in the entryway there for those that are going to be at the class. And I say it that way, if, if you're going to be at the class, please take one of those books and read the first chapter for Wednesday. If you're not going to be at one of the uh, Bethany classes, please do not take the books today. Uh, when the Bethany Bible class finishes the class, then we'll have the books there, and, and then anybody can take them and use them for their home study. Uh, but today, keep them just for the people that will be at the Bethany Bible class. Uh, next Sunday, we're going to shift to what be our fall schedule. Uh, normally, that would be Sunday school and Bible class starting at 9.15, but I don't think we're ready to start Sunday school out in the Sunday school room with the kids yet and teacher and with the surge going on. So we're not going to have Sunday school start. Pay it, watch for that as to when things that hopefully that line starts going back down and then we'll have Sunday school again uh, out in the Sunday school room. Uh, but if you would like the lessons, if you would like to do some homeschooling with the lessons, I do have um, sheets for the various grades uh, that are available in the fellowship hall. Uh, I also have some out in the Sunday school room because I didn't bring all the grades over here this morning. Um, if you would like those, I'd be happy to give them to you and you can use it uh, to teach at home and then we'll work out what we're going to do otherwise with that. Bible class, we're going to try that though uh, because I think we'll only have maybe 10 people sitting around that uh, rectangle of tables in the fellowship hall. Uh, we'll start the, the book of Acts next Sunday and then worship service as starting next Sunday and through the winter months, well fall, winter and spring months will be at 10.30, so next Sunday, 10.30 worship service. And then church council will be at noon uh, next Sunday. Otherwise, that's it for now for the people that are watching us at home.